so here's the thing, guys. Jon Stewart recently uh, attended a Pentagon's a, a Pentagon Department of Defense like war conference basically a place where you know every year they get together a bunch of the military industrial complex comes together uh they give out awards to different people for doing different things you know they're they're shiny new tanks shiny new uh bombs uh etc 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 you know uh you know kind of like a like a professional conference except for people who kill other people for a living um now john stewart talked at this event uh and of course the uh the the jimmy doors of the world the brianna joy grays of the world the uh max blumenthal's of the world you know the the kind of fashy leftists the 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 slippery little eels of the uh, uh of the left um decided that they were going to uh just go all out uh and you know john stewart he's he's bad now he's he's the most libyist lefty okay um and so you got uh you got articles like this popping up on gray zone uh gray zone noted for their uh defense of assad uh, and strangely enough, given an award by uh, Assad's regime. Uh, strangely enough, but uh, let, let's can, let's take a look at this. Defense Department sponsored Warrior Games featured liberal comedian John Stewart awarding a member of Ukraine's neo-Nazi Azov Battalion at Disney World. Uh, the Pentagon refused to tell the Gray Zone whether U.S. taxpayers funded the foreign competitor's travel. Uh, this August, during the Def Department of Defense annual Warrior Games at Disney World in Orlando, Florida, this August, the 19th through the 28th, liberal comedian Jon Stewart awarded a Ukrainian military veteran named Ihor Halushka the Heart of the Team Award for inspiring his team with his uh, personal example. Uh, Halushka happens to have been a member of the neo-Nazi uh, Azov Battalion, which has been armed by the U.S. and integrated into the Ukrainian National Guard. The award-winning ultra-nationalist wore a sleeve over his left arm as he accepted the prize, presumably to cover up his tattoo of the Nazi Sonnenrad, uh, or Black Sun. There's a picture of him in the hospital, after what appears to have been a pretty serious injury. Um, the pair are part of a team of 40 Ukrainian veterans participating in the Warrior Games. Uh, they were joined at the ceremony for this year's competition by Darius Rucker, the former vocalist for the glorified bar band Hootie and the Blowfish, and liberal comedian Jon Stewart. Uh, Jon Stewart delivered some opening remarks at the Warrior Games. Uh, during the closing ceremony, Stewart awarded the Azov Battalion's Halushka with the Heart of the Team Award. The announcer proclaimed that Ihor inspires his team with his personal example and unique sense of humor. Sergeant First Class Ihor Halushka embodies the spirit and determination that is the heart of Team Ukraine. Stuart triumphantly bellowed Ihor as the Nazi was presented with his trophy. Uh, prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of this year, mainstream outlets from the Daily Beast to Vox to foreign policy and even the U.S. government propaganda outlet Voice of America have each acknowledged the Azov Battalion's embrace of Nazism. Uh, right Sector Group has similarly identified uh, has been similarly identified as a fascist organization. Since the invasion, however, the Western uh, corporate media has downplayed the presence of Nazis in the Ukrainian armed forces as groups like Azov have taken on prominent frontline roles. Reached by phone, Warrior Games Communication Director Travis Claytor would not tell the Gray Zone who covered the travel expenses of Team Ukraine and other foreign competitors. Uh, Claytor merely stated that the Department of Defense is not responsible for their costs. However, he noted that the relationship with each team is different. Uh, Ukraine and Canada are the only uh, foreign teams participating in this year's competition. So what is the competition exactly? Kind of vague. I, I guess, what is the Warrior Games? Okay. Com competitions include shooting, wheelchair, rugby, cycling, powerlifting, indoor rowing, wheelchair basketball, uh, field, golf, track, swimming, sitting volleyball, and archery. This is the first year Team Ukraine has particip participated in the Warrior Gra Games. Its athletes came away with at least 18 gold medals. Um, 
Okay, so it basically just seems like a little, like, international competition thing for veterans, I, I would assume. Uh, let's see. As the Grey Zone reported, the head of Ukraine's uh, Veterans Affairs Agency attended a 2019 neo-Nazi uh, black metal concert featuring several anti-Semitic metal bands and promoted the event on Facebook. And then something about the past uh, Invictus Games, I guess, are another veteran organization thing? Um, let's see. Wait, th this is a fascist salute? I okay, I don't know about that one, guys. I don't know about this one. I I feel like there are other other organizations other than fascists have done have done like the the fist to the chest gesture. Okay? I feel like that that has happened before in military history. Mm, yes. Mm. Yeah, uh, mm, we're we'll we'll get to you uh the hill the hills rising. Yes, indeed, we will. Um, yep, here's uh, John Stewart, uh, Department of the Defense, uh, Warrior Games, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Space Force, and SOCOM. Is this one of those moments where someone you hate makes a good point? Uh, fuck John Stewart for giving trophies to Nazis. He does literally have a black sun on his arm. Well, I would imagine that the reason John Stewart is at this event is related to the fact that he's been working for years to get rights for veterans passed. Ain't this a bit? And I'm guessing that part of his, uh, part of how the PAC that act got passed was him working extensively with veterans rights organizations, and maybe a part of him working with those organizations was also him appearing at this event. This does not seem like an event that Jon Stewart would go to just because. Yeah. Yep. Ain't this a bitch? It's probably related to this. America's heroes who fought in our wars outside sweating their asses off with oxygen also, let's uh, let's take a moment to acknowledge the fact that implying John Stewart, a Jewish man, is uh, a, not a, not just a Jewish man, a Jewish leftist who is fought tirelessly for like veterans' rights and human rights across America, and has done more for leftism in America than any of the chuckle fucks at the gray zone. Um is a Nazi sympathizer is pretty is pretty fucked, right? I, I think we can agree that's pretty fucked. And borderline anti-Semitic. I I would say it's anti-Semitic. I think you could argue it's not. But I would say pointing at Jon Stewart calling him a Nazi sympathizer like is pretty fucked. Uh I know you're not going so that far, Bisa Do, but that is the entire implication of the reports on places like Grey Zone. That is the entire implication that they are aiming at here. And you know what? Let's, uh. Let's see. Yeah. Also, that guy was one of 40 people on his team. They weren't all Nazis, guys. <laughs> like. You know, you know we have we have Nazis in our police force in America. We have Nazis in our uh, military right now, okay? Like the fact that like if a police officer gets a medal after like stopping a shooting or something and might have like a white nationalist tattoo on it doesn't mean that like oh, we're giving him look, we're giving the white nationalist a medal. No, it the, the reason he's getting a medal is not related to the white nationalism. Um, didn't Stewart come out against trans people? I, I think you're getting that mixed up with Ricky Gervais. John, John Stewart is, as far as I know, not transphobic. But you know what? Let's take a look. 
at the Hill. The Department of Defense sponsored Warrior Games features liberal comedian Jon Stewart awarding a member of Ukraine's neo Nazi Azov Battalion at Disney World. The- now, I will clarify that I agree that the Azov Battalion is made up of predominant, predominantly, if not entirely, of neo Nazis. That being said, they are fighting a war for their survival as a country. It's not that surprising that extremist militias then got roped into official, uh, like, military positions. Okay? So, that's a part of this, too. That, that's another piece that often gets glossed over by this, but, like, yeah, I'm sorry, they don't have the, uh, the, the exactly the luxury or manpower to be, like, turning their noses up at trained troops who are willing to go and get shot at who are of fighting age you know like and frankly again and this is my very controversial opinion i think it's good when nazis get shot at uh and would prefer them being the the cannon fodder of choice in basically any conflict um and yeah if he got injured at doing that and then got sent off to like some Department of Defense, like, sponsored event. I, I, I don't care. He's, fu- as far as I'm concerned, he's fulfilled his purpose. Um, they didn't have the army and the only ones willing to fight in 2014, uh, were neo-Nazis. Yeah. Um, oh, Jon Stewart didn't condemn Chappelle and just didn't enter the conversation. Yeah. All the Republicans voted against the bill that would investigate white supremacy in our police and military. Yeah, because Republicans tend to support white supremacy. Yeah. The Gray Zone reports that multiple Ukrainian Nazis were invited to the happiest place on Earth. By now, keep in mind, while these people were invited to Disney World by the Pentagon, they weren't invited because they were Nazis. They were invited because they were wounded veterans who were wounded in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, they they were inviting veterans from Ukraine. I okay. The Pentagon. But don't worry, his black his Nazi, sorry, black sun tattoo was covered up when he received the award. According to Wikipedia, the black sun symbol is widely used by neo-fascists, neo-Nazis, the far right, and white nationalists. How interesting. I thought it was, uh, was wasn't it as disinformation to say that we were funding uh, Nazi fighters in the Ukraine, but... Uh, it, it's not disinformation, but we're not funding them because they're Nazis. We're funding the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian military drafted all men of fighting age, which includes ne- neo-Nazis? Like, do these people think that, like, if a draft happens, like, neo-Nazis are, like, exempt from the draft? You know, like, like if a draft happens, guys, it's done, irrel- like, like, without regard for your political affiliation. You guys know that, right? Um... Okay, what is what exactly is the Warrior Games? Because I feel like that's going to be really, uh, really important here. Oh yeah, the Warrior Games. <laughs> yep, celebrates the resilient resiliency and dedication of wounded, ill, and injured active duty and veteran U.S. military service members. Yeah. So basically, all of these people have been injured while defending Ukraine. And the people who are going, going to be on the front lines of the Ukrainian conflict, the soonest, and who have had the time to recover enough to participate in a sporting event, would probably be uh, not insubstantially neo-Nazis. Yeah, the, it's, para, it's the Paralympics specifically for veterans. Yeah. Okay, he defended Dave by saying he thought Dave Chappelle didn't do his jokes to harm the trans community or something like that. He was like, Dave is a good guy. I mean, I understand. I understand a comedian who knows Dave Chappelle, like, thinking that. Uh, and I disagree. But also, I don't think that's indicative of Jon Stewart being transphobic. I think that's, uh, that's indicative more of Jon Stewart 
having like uh blindness about his friend and or being a older person guys guys john stewart is not like a spring chicken okay uh, not only are they uh, using uh, or being protected by weapons and things we've made available for Ukraine, we're actually just giving them medals now, invitations to Disney World. Yeah, That's look, nice. I don't think, you know, it's not necessarily Jon Stewart's fault. To, you know, he didn't, I'm sure he didn't request, mm -hmm. <laughs> can you please send one of the Nazis over to receive this award? <laughs> one Nazi, but, please. I mean, the fact that they keep, look, yeah. this, this is the conversation that keeps happening. Folks say... Sure, there's neo-Nazis among the ranks of Ukrainian soldiers, but yep. we also have fringe elements in our own military, and bringing them up and, and emphasizing their existence is simply a way to deflect from a war effort. It's a moral war, and we should be involved in that regardless. I obviously don't agree in the... I mean, let, let's be honest here. When Russia invaded Ukraine, far more neo-Nazis entered Ukraine, okay? The, the the population of neo Nazis in Ukraine when Russia invaded uh, jumped by like a factor of five. Okay, and, and emphasizing their existence is simply a way to deflect from a war effort. It's a moral war, and we should be involved in that regardless. I obviously don't agree. Disron, that is correct. The Azov Battalion is like maybe 400, 500 people, um, and the overall armed forces of Ukraine consists of. Uh, thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Unlimited uh, spending on a war that has very little to do with uh, the interests of the American people. However... Yeah, the, what, what interest could America have in not allowing unchecked aggression, aggression of someone that was a, of, a, of a group of people who are potentially a, a foreign ally? I, I can take that <sighs> argument on its face. The problem is, if you keep having moments exactly, where Neon accidental Death. Nazis keep showing up, it undermines the argument that they are so limited and so fringe in number. I would not expect to take a random member of the American military, you know, strip them down and see a white supremacist tattoo. No. Yeah, but we aren't talking about a random member of the Ukrainian military. We're talking specifically about a person who falls into two categories. A wounded combat vet who has also had enough time to recover and has the ability to compete in a sporting event. I mean, it's me, Natalie Marie. I, I, I think the evidence indicates that this person is a current neo-Nazi. Modern uh, battalions tend to range, range between 500 and 1,000 troops. It's not even a strategically significantly sized unit. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about this, you know, you have the two categories, wounded and has had enough time uh, to recover, meaning that this is a person who would be uh, on the front lines of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And frankly, the people who are most likely to get uh, wounded were the people in the Luhansk and Dohansk, uh, Donetsk region of Ukraine. Which, guys, I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you know this, guys. Um, that's predominantly where the Azov Battalion operated. So, yeah, yeah there's... There's probably a disproportionate amount of Azov wounded who are now physically fit enough to compete in foreign Paralympic events, specifically geared towards veterans. So anyway, that's that's the basic gist of it. It will you're, happen. You're not Tally Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm referencing that uh, that time that fact checker um, claimed that in a photo a of a of a mil I think it was a oh, was it I think it was a military okay. officer might have been a police officer claimed they had a, a, a Nazi iron, iron cross but and it, it was, was just not, like a Christian just symbol a or something yeah. yeah look and certainly it happens and there are a lot of symbols that I personally find distasteful but that aren't you know a one for one to white supremacy you know uh, Confederate flags and the like I'm not wild about it mm -hmm. I would swipe left but it's a thing that people. Have. You don't, you don't uh, put uh, must-have Punisher uh, logos <laughs> on their phones right. in your dating uh, app. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I do not. Yeah. But like at a certain point, it, and, it, and there's also, I think, a legitimate case that there is it is a problem within our own military that there are like fringe elements. I think that that's the the. the I find Brianna Joy Gray irritating on a number of levels. 
I feel like she she slides around a lot of positions like in a way I find extremely disingenuous. Technology there almost undermines your point about the our own Wait, did she just say she's not offended by the rebel flag? Wait. I'm sorry. I I was focusing more on like her rhetorical position and not necessarily the exact wording of what she was saying. It's a thing that combined a Christian symbol a or something. Yeah. yeah, look, it, and certainly it happens. And there are a lot of symbols that I personally find distasteful, but that aren't, you know, a one for one to white supremacy, you know, uh, Confederate flags and the like. I'm not wild about it. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm pretty sure that the Confederate flag in 2022 is pretty one-to-one -one, uh, white supremacy on there. Yeah. Okay. Sh oh, all right, go, go on. I would swipe left, but it's a thing that people have. You don't, you don't uh, put uh, must-have Punisher uh, <laughs> logos on their phones right. in your dating uh, app. Right. Yeah, yeah they, again, Brianna Joy Gray wanted to agree with Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, she is not the... Uh, she is not someone to uh, share great takes. Uh, Nindreen, thank you very much for subscribing and resubscribing. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. You've been sub- wait, you subscribed for 26 months? You've been subscribed for 26 months. Thank you very much. And yo, that means I've been doing this for over two years now, guys. Please continue to sub to stream so that I, you know, can continue doing this for another two and a half years. Let's go. I, I, yeah. I do not. Yeah. But like at a certain point, it, and, it, and there's also, I think, a legitimate case that there is it is a problem within our own military that there are you sub six like, months at elements. a time. I think that that's, yeah. the, the 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 analogy there almost undermines your point about the our own issues with our own extremism in our country. It doesn't make it better that it's happening elsewhere. But at a certain point, it becomes super negligent. If you were covering up a tattoo, that means that somebody was aware of the tattoo and still chose to go ahead with this if it's being reported accurately. It underscores the point that in every conflict. There are always yeah, good and bad that. people on both sides. Yeah. It is always murkier than the, we want it to be this, you know, this world war. Yeah, it is. It is always pretty murky, isn't it? Which is why this kind of seems uh, like sus reporting. Or to ask moral contrast between the forces of good and an army of evil. And that's how we want to view every conflict. And apart from World War II, you can't ever really put that that easy framing on things. We, you know, in our in our. I mean, it's a bit easy when there's an aggressor invading another country. That that makes it somewhat simple in, in these cases. Our, in our adventures in the Middle East, we have had to work with groups who are engaged in violence and terrorism and have, and have uh, uh, harmed women's rights and other people's rights. And we've done that because we think, well, they're pre preferable to these other guys or they're more sympathetic right. to the US. And that's what we're doing here, yeah. because that's always what we're doing. But we can't, and, and, and we can determine, we can say, look, we think this is in our best national security interests, so we have to do this. I would argue that this is not necessarily in our best right. national security interests, but that's not even what they're saying. They're saying, right, this is a moral conflict between good and evil, and the, and the Ukrainian cause is good. And, and look, the cause itself is correct. They yes, got invaded, got and invaded, they shouldn't be invaded. And you shouldn't be invaded. But look, I actually I disagree a little bit. I do think that there are, it is possible in many cases, outside of just World War II, to say that there are moral stakes that arguably, ethically, America is called to defend. My issue with Ukraine is that that is never the metric by which we get involved, generally right. speaking. And when I asked people to help me understand at the beginning of this conflict, I was, as I was trying to understand it, what justifies our intervention here and not an X, Y, or Z instance where there, I would argue, is an enormous um, moral call to act and intervene on the behalf of unambiguously. Well, because they were in the process of joining an international treaty that would have protected them, uh, an international treaty with us, uh, on top of the fact that they are being invaded by a belligerent nuclear power, um, and on top of that, like they are being invaded by 
not just a belligerent nuclear power, but an authoritarian nuclear power. A, uh, I, I would argue like a proto-fascist nuclear power, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that there is a vested interest uh, for the U.S. to, uh, to, I mean, basically empower Ukraine to embroil Russia in a conflict that will break their ability to uh, continue such uh, belligerence going forward. Vulnerable people across the world. No one could explain why, because the issue was not the moral issue. It's not like the the like like I I don't know. I it seems to me like empowering Ukraine to break the back of Russia's military so that it can't go and invade other countries like Azerbaijan uh, is something that is maybe a good thing going forward. The Pentagon does a ranking of, of traumatized people on the planet mm -hmm. Earth and says, let's start at the top right. or let's see where the, what's, what's, what's the biggest bang for our buck. You know, how many lives can this dollar of American money save? No, that's not how they're going about this at all. So I really balk at the idea of there being this um, moral call to justice when you have moments like this that obviously undermine the case. Mm. Well, speaking of- Why aren't we stepping in uh, when it, we're seeing genocide occurring? Well, historically, America doesn't care about genocide. Yes, I know Russia wouldn't invade as Azerbaijan. I, I was using it as an example because it's nearby Russia. <sighs> Come on, let's not let's not be super pedantic. You know what I meant. Um, to be fair, America has caused some genocide. Yeah, we have. Just just some, just a little a little genocide. Um, now, I would argue also that America mostly isn't getting involved in a conflict where genocide is occurring, uh, because there's not, like, a strategic material interest to be had in, uh, ending or intervening. Because, again, military interventions cost a lot of money, and they tend to be justified with, uh, the acquisition of resources. And that's primarily what America is interested in. of morality across the pond Europeans are grappling with soaring energy prices but Germany's federal minister for foreign affairs has said their support for Ukraine will remain unwavering and voters be damned watch but if I give the promise to people in Ukraine we stand with you as long as you need us then I want to deliver, no matter what my German voters think, but I want to deliver to the people of Ukraine. And this is why, for me, it's important to be always very frank and clear. And this means every measure I'm taking, I have to be clear that this holds on as long as Ukraine needs me. We are facing now a winter time where we will be challenged as democratic politicians. People will go on the street and say, we cannot pay our energy prices. And I will say, yes, I know. So we help you with social measures. But I don't want to say, OK, then we stop the sanctions against uh, Russia. We will stand with Ukraine, and this means the sanctions will stay also in winter time even if it gets really tough for po politicians the sanctions haven't even worked that's a different issue yeah, also no matter what my german voters think is quite the sanctions haven't worked i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm, I'm sorry guys no the the sanctions are actually working quite well chat the sanctions on Russia have effectively crippled their entire economy. Okay? Yeah, let's, let's take a look. Uh, Vladimir Putin in April maintained the West could never strangle Russia's economy. Um, okay. We can confidently say that this policy towards Russia has failed, he told his officials. The strategy of an economic blitzkrieg has failed. Um... Now, six months after the beginning of the war and the imposition of the sanctions, many observers are questioning whether Western sanctions have had the tough effects their architects promised. International observers, such as the International Monetary Fund, have revised their projection, projections of Russian GDP upward from earlier this year compared with initial forecasts made right after the impositions of sanctions. Russia's economy has done better than expected, part, partly because of deft uh, technocratic Russian policymaking and partly because of tight global energy markets, which have kept the price of oil and gas high. Um, 
isn't rising basically Russian propaganda at this point? I mean, kinda. Yeah. Um, let's see. Russia's economic overperformance must be placed in context, however. Few observers and policymakers expected sanctions to cause enough pain to force Russia out of the conflict in a matter of months. So Russia's ongoing war shouldn't be a surprise. Yet Russia's economy is still hurting. It is suffering a steeper growth slowdown than was seen during the 2008 financial crisis, and one that is unlikely to be followed by a post-crisis rebound. Living standards are being supported by social spending that will be difficult to sustain, and that will likely force tough decisions about the government budget over the coming year. Thus far, Putin has promised Russians that he's fighting the special military operation, not a war that could impose tough sacrifices on the population. As time passes, however, the cost of the war and the effects of sanctions on ordinary Russians will only grow. Yeah, by the way, uh, once, by the way, they're still keeping up the fiction that this is a special military operation, but there are going to be two events coming up that are basically going to force Russia's hand, right? And one is uh, essentially uh, a, a lack of manpower forcing through uh, some kind of general draft. Uh, recently, uh, Putin says that uh, they've had uh, recruitment efforts to raise like 160,000 some Russian troops. Um, but keep in mind that that is being done at an exorbitant cost like we're, we're talking like the equivalent of hiring conscripts for like or hiring hiring people off the street for like a hundred thousand dollars if they manage to survive out the year you know like it is not a sustainable uh application of like of resources at all and if they reach the point where they need to go into a general draft then it becomes very clear that Russia has to admit to the Russian people that it has been lying the entire time and that they are actually fighting a, a general war. The, on, on the flip side, they, I, they either have to institute a general draft or they have to uh, narrow the scope of the conflict even further. And keep in mind, uh, Russia has already given up on taking over Ukraine uh, proper. Now they are focusing on taking Luhansk and Donetsk, okay? Um, and there is a... It, it's looking like Ukraine might be able to even take back Crimea. Uh, so this is not a situation in which, like... It, it, it's basically either Russia conscripts its citizens forcibly, or making this already unpopular war even more unpopular, or they scale back to, like, uh, supporting Luhansk instead of Donetsk, or they, they stop the conflict altogether. Um, this is not something that it ends well for Russia in either case. Um, there have already been uh, numerous reported stories of Russian... Uh, units defecting en masse to, uh, to surrender to Ukrainians. Um, like, guys, this isn't, this isn't going the way that Russia is saying it's going, okay? All right. Sting admission. It, right, it's one, uh, it's one maybe our own American elected <laughs> officials could actually concede that the voters are not necessarily so down with this. Um, I mean, it's tacit, right? I mean, it, look... It is not the case that every time there's a majority of people who want something is necessarily great or moral right. or a good idea. Right. Although, what if you send me sixty nine dollars, Entrema? You should do that, but also, that would not be as much as I would get if you signed up for HelloFresh. That on foreign policy, if elected officials hewed closer to what the majority of Americans want on foreign policy more than any other issue, I probably in my view, you would have an improvement in policy. I mean, I think so too, because who does war benefit? Who's profiting right, right now off of the, these excursions? And always the people have turned against, uh, in, in the US, at least in my lifetime, at least since 9-11, the people have turned against Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, everything else lemonade. before the elected officials, yeah. far before yes. the generals and the military, et cetera. Yes, the media was mad about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Biden's polls went up. Yeah. The people were happy about it. It happens over and over again. So I don't know. It, it is, it is, 
frustrating that we only have the tacit admission of that here, but the explicit admission of it there. And when you look at who's profiting from this, when you look at the fact that you have a revolving door of Raytheon employees who are staffing the Defense Department, when you see the level of investment that these companies, I'm sorry, the, the theme of the day. One oh two thousand. Unironically, yes, he is fashy as hell. For me, at least, it's kind of been lobbying powers hurting America. It was a thing of my radar. Yeah, yeah. It keeps coming up yeah. in all of these segments. You can't look at Lloyd Austin. You can't look at the you know Secretary of Defense coming straight from these companies. You can't look at uh, you know Biden taking time out of his schedule to go down to the plant. Okay, yeah, but that's a separate issue, right? Like that. Those are all valid concerns, but they're a separate issue from should we provide aid to Ukraine so it can defend itself against Russian aggression? Like, the, the problems, the immense number of problems with the military-industrial complex are a separate question and a separate issue from, like, the, the commodification of war, okay? Uh, the, maybe... Using, like, using this story about Jon Stewart giving a, a medal to a veteran to uh, s basically s say that the entire armed forces of Ukraine are Nazis, uh, or predominantly Nazis, and we shouldn't support them because that's also what companies want to do to sell more of their war machines. Like... This isn't a that this isn't a good argument. This is just three separate talking points fused together to create some kind of Frankenstein monster. Except the issue is Frankenstein's monster uh, was actually really smart and intelligent. This is more like Frankenstein's abandoned failed attempt to make a monster. Okay, this is this is like the 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 stitched together corpses of several different arguments, uh, none of which function together. Yeah, it's three bad points in a trench coat. And what was it, Louisiana? I have considered that America is bad. And while I agree to an extent, uh, this isn't one of the bad things that America's done. And talking about how this was a good thing for America. You can't look at who exactly profits off of, off of sending these rocket launchers and things to Ukraine and not understand that this is just another... Uh, you know, prong of the military industrial complex and a profit scheme for people who are absolutely not us and are not the people who are fighting and dying in this war. Katie Halper likes to say that. Hey, guess what? I know this might be hard for some people to hear. Every war has people looking to profit on it. Every single one. Guess what? There were people who profited off of World War II. Does that mean that America shouldn't have gotten involved in the conflict? No. Just because there are in like capitalists in a capitalist world looking to make a profit off of a horrible situation doesn't mean you should just settle into inaction. <sighs> yeah, we could send weapons to dozens of other places if we just wanted to boast boost DoD profit. Hell, we we could actually send weapons to all kinds of good PR places. You know, to to boost DOD profit, but we don't for a variety of geopolitical co uh, reasons that are extremely complicated. Um, it's a lot. The war in Ukraine will end through diplomacy one way or another, sooner rather than later. And people are making the argument that by escalating and, and sending weapons and showing force from Ukraine, it forces uh, Russia to the bargaining table. But with recent reporting that we covered here on the show this right. week, um, that we talked to Aaron Mate about uh, how, you know, in, what was it, April, very, very early in the conflict, uh, or right before a, the conflict, They had a model rather, for a deal. They had a model, had a model for, a, model for deal a deal that the West undermined, yeah. right? They, they, you know, so the idea that we would stop- Yeah, yeah, very early in the conflict, they had a model for the deal. Uh, if I recall correctly, the deal was to grant, like, Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, like, uh, independence, and it was also to, uh, 
oh god what was the other the other bit of it it was also you can never join nato and also basically you had to disarm the entire country which i don't know if you guys if you guys know this but uh in hindsight one probably shouldn't praise that deal given the fact that russia invaded the country you know probably probably shouldn't have shouldn't just trust at face value that the guys who then subsequently invaded the country uh uh w would have played ball by that agreement because it uh, really seems easy to walk right in to a, a an undefended country uh and annex it uh if they're demilitarized had and stopped. I'm sorry, it just isn't, isn't borne out by reality and the facts and the history and the reporting on the table. And so people have to really start asking what's motivating this conflict and making demands of their politicians to do different. Now it's going to be hard because the politicians are sitting here saying to your face, I'm not going to respond to democratic demands. I don't think in the case of, uh, of what guides our foreign policy and military ventures, I'm not, I'm not saying that it is not due to defense contracting and that sort of level. I absolutely think that has an effect. I think it is partly and in my view probably more so ideological uh the the state the deep state the the military advisors are so ideologically uh, ideologically committed to a hawkish you know forced democracy on people well yes of. but that's part of it it's also part of this uh, economic superstructure but it's not just ah uh, yes the classic forcing of democracy Historically, the average the average person hates having a say in how their government is run. This guy, yo, yo. This, this guy is unironically a fascist. Okay? The the guy on the right here is unironically a fascist. He hates democracy, he loves capitalism, and he takes any opportunity to uh shit on uh the gays, transes, and pretty much anyone who's, like, not a cis white dude, okay? Globalism. Lining their no, 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 it's not something. just it's because... They believe they can do that. Wait. I missed, I missed her saying, uh, deep state? Deep state, the, the military advisors are so ideologically, uh, ideologically committed to a hawkish, you know, forced democracy on people. Well, yes, of. but that's part of it. It's also part of this uh, economic superstructure. But it's not just Glo because Raytheon's li lining their pockets No, no, no it's not something. just it's because... Like, okay, if I was going to be extremely charitable about Brianna Joy Gray... It's that she has an extremely, extremely misplaced sense of how to co-opt fascist arguments. Or how to counter them, rather. How to deal with them, how to handle them. Because the only way to respond to a fascist argument like democracy is uh, is being forced upon people or like uh the deep state is controlling everything is not to explain the intricacies of economic superstructure okay the people who are responding to the fascist argument aren't going to like nod along to your economic superstructure argument all right they're not going to like be converted out of their fashy conservative lines of thinking they're going to be just seeing you as lending validity to the fascist talking point. This is Brianna Joy Gray thinking that she is, she is, you know, turning the tables. And we saw this in her conversation with Cenk, uh, Cenk Uger of the Young Turks. Uh, we covered that conversation and you can see it. She, she tries to explain to Cenk that she's actually, she's like five steps ahead of all of those conservatives out there. You know, she she's just co-opting their conservative ideas and, you know, secretly guiding them to to the true leftist ideas. But yeah, you thought rising was leftist, but it was me, Dio. Uh, it is. Who is Brianna's target audience? Well, vegan vanguard girl, Brianna's target audience in when she's on the hill or on the on rising, as far as I can tell, is the are the conservatives in the audience that her target is trying to 
sway conservatives over to uh, leftist ideas. You know, in her conversation with Jenk, she uh, acknowledged that the Rising's audience is uh, more conservative, and therefore she's trying to make arguments that will bring conservatives over, except that, that, that this isn't how you bring conservatives over. Conservatives are drawn to arguments uh, to authority, arguments to uh, power. You know, the, this is why conservatives are historically and currently drawn towards fascism. And she's trying to, like, outthink fascism. But that's the thing. Fascism doesn't have a brain. Fascism is entirely reactionary. Fascism is just an attempt to co-opt everything to grow its own power. And the only way to properly respond to the dipshit she's on this panel with, or on this show with, is to laugh in his fucking face. It's to laugh at him and make him seem silly, but obviously that wouldn't work since they're co-hosts. So instead, she has deluded herself into thinking that by being on Rising, she can outsmart all of the conservatives out there. But and I can tell you this from, does she qualify as a tanky? I don't think she qualifies as a tanky. I think she qualifies as a dipshit. Um, she, she thinks that she is able to, like, she, she's the conservo whisperer, that she's able to bring them over, uh, and that people who disagree with her are, are, are simply too stupid to see the light. That's it. That, like... She's coming from a place of, like, intellectual superiority, or perceived intellectual per uh, superiority. Um, what's a tanky? A tanky is a, a fascist who uses, uh, like, the, the colors and the uh, aesthetic of leftism, whether that's socialism or communism doesn't really matter because they're fascist it, it's the a tanky is someone who believes that uh the democratic nature of socialism and communism is at all compatible with authoritarianism uh has she has she could trans people the bourgeois yet dr robotnik I, I i did not follow that has she called trans people the bourgeois yet um, I don't know what her stance is on trans people. I just know her stance on politics is garbage. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's finish this up. They believe they can do this. That the, the American military might can in, can install democracy. Well, and they must. And they can't admit that they're wrong and, because and, it undermines the entire decades and decades of this thinking. Which right. And worked. they must to, I'm sorry, prop up our economic system that so many places around the world have tried to shirk because the way that, the way that neoliberal policies hurt poor and working people. Part of the mm. bedrock of the conflict in Ukraine. And that's true. Neoliberal policies do hurt poor and working people. But that has very little to do with Ukraine not wanting to be taken over by an authoritarian uh, <laughs> a country that is trying to invade them with their military. Like, again, uh, she's Frankensteining all of these things together that just don't make an argument. Ukraine was that it was being torn between a kind of a Russian economic relief package and a Western economic IMF course of action that would force it into neoliberalism, that would force wages down and hurt a lot of the people that are living in the country. And it was a, it's a it's a it's a Faustian bargain. Many people in the country were actually opting to move in line with the Russian version, and that's when we had them. What made gets what gets smeared as neoliberal? Well, this is probably a, a longer decision that's for it, a different time. But uh, <laughs> by liberal, we mean like market forces. The yes, North I'm European sorry. countries seem to if have really happy neoliberal economies that are very successful well, if, and very. If, if we believed in real democracy and self-determination than when Venezuela, if it wants to be socialist, if Cuba wants to be socialist, if the USSR wants to do their thing, then we wouldn't have wars of aggression and sanction regimes that keep the people in those countries from having the, the kind of society well, we that they we want to structure. That, but um, so I just want to be clear 
that Brianna Joy Gray does not un understand the power dynamic of the Cold War. First of all, uh, the USSR was not a peaceful regime. Second of all, it was a nuclear power. Third of all, it neither the USSR nor the United States, left to their own devices, would have simply not invaded any country. This is not... This is not something that... I don't, I, I don't think she understands. I, I think she thinks she knows what she's saying. I don't think she actually knows what she's saying. Like, the USSR was an authoritarian state predicated on its war machine. I'm, I'm, I am baffled. I, you know, we kind of dodged a bullet when it comes to this, okay? A at the very least, she's not working for Bernie Sanders anymore, okay? Yeah, and and they, the their socialism fight, wouldn't be magically successful if we were nice. Well, to how will we ever know if we don't try to undermine it at every turn? I think we. No, can. well, we, they, there has never been a level of confidence that that would be the case that prevented the United States from going and intervening. The fact of the U.S. is intervening. Inter now, to be fair, we should let Venezuela just kind of do its thing, and we should let Cuba do its own thing. We should end the blockade around Cuba. The fact that we still have one in 2022 is kind of insane um or not the blockade the the uh embargo yeah u.s imperialism bad russia good i guess yeah russia russia famous for not doing any imperialism throughout the last century how insecure they are about whether or not people would verminoid i am gay and it's lovely i love you I'm going to have a lot of gay sex later. It's going to be great. Choose outside of being at the tip well, we don't of the need gun, to be, capitalism. Sure. We don't need to be insecure about it, but... <laughs> All right. We know. Whether it's the police state here at home that it's increasingly militarized. We can let everyone who wants to go to North Korea and be immediately imprisoned uh, as a assumed spy it's, if they want to. All right. So at the at the tip of the gun, Americans enforce capitalism here at home. No. no we we talked about to. the Breonna Taylor raid. We talked about how they're forcing imminent domain slash. Breonna Taylor. What does that have to do with? See, Brianna, this is every, Brianna Taylor is neoliberalism. This is the, this is the, Robbie, just, everything is neoliberalism. We just had a segment about. See, guys, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is exactly what I was talking about, chat. She thinks that she's like maneuvering people like Robbie over to the left and she's not. She's absolutely not. She's not leading the people who think Robbie ha makes great points to to a better conclusion she's just lending validity to robbie's points and then speaking a lot of nonsense to the other people to the people who listen to him you can't fix these people oh well, the there is a gentrific gentrification regime where they were trying to do a high uh, right. like like see just note the power dynamics here right note note the power dynamics which I think is what's most important for conservative viewers of The Rising, okay? Uh, because again, conservatives value power over being right, okay? So just note the power dynamics in this exchange. And Americans enforce capitalism here at home. No, no we, we talked about to... the Breonna Taylor raid. We talked about how they're forcing imminent domain slash. Breonna Taylor, what does that have to do with? See, Breonna... This is every... Breonna Taylor is neoliberalism. This is the, this is the, Robbie, just, everything is neoliberalism. We just had a segment about how the, there is a gentrific gentrification regime where they were trying to do a high uh, right. de development project. So they were harassing residents in the area to try to clear it out for, for development. I mean, all of these things are connected. And what the left tries to do is make the case for why we have to have international solidarity and why we have to be very skeptical of these kinds of hyper-militaristic arms. For me, the government... Yeah, except, except... And this is what uh, Brianna Joy Gray doesn't get. People like Robbie and the people who agree with Robbie think that that's a good thing. Think that what you are describing is good. Also, uh, Beer Bash Johnson, uh, thank you very much for the raid. I hope you had a great stream, and I really, much, I really, really appreciate it. Government violating people's private property rights is choices. not neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is the government leaving people alone. All right, we'll have to keep debating that one, but we will have more rising for you for sure after this. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to look at the comments here.
Let's see. Is anyone is anyone going to talk about this? It's all going to be about John Stewart, isn't it? Hmm. Not as bad as I thought they'd be. Um. All right. Hail Soybeck! Hello, hello, hello. Um. Yeah. It look. This is uh. By the way. Very much. Uh, similar to Jimmy Dore going on and uh, having this delightful interview with a Boogaloo Boy. Uh, for those of you who don't know who, what the Boogaloo Boys are, uh, Boogaloo Boys are uh, folks prepping for the race war, okay? Uh, Boogaloo is a term meant specifically to refer to race war. Is this new? No, this isn't new. This is old. But Keep in mind, Jimmy Dore, Brianna Joy Gray, uh, The Gray Zone, all these people uh, run in the same circle. So while you have, while you have Jon Stewart uh, at an event for veterans presenting a medal to a veteran uh, who happens to be from Ukraine and that he didn't know was a neo-Nazi, um, and they're all criticizing Jon Stewart for doing that, no, Jimmy Dore goes and has like a 40 minute long interview with someone who believes race war is a good thing and something that should be prepped for. Uh, and uh, not only that, uh, Jimmy Dore thinks that, you know, the left could learn a lot from these people who are prepping for a race war. You know, they're they're good guys, actually. To Boogaloo boys. Oh, that, that's just because kind of the whole thing the media doesn't talk about with the Boogaloo Boys is we're more of like the libertarian Green Party militia. Like if, if I wanted to join a regular militia that flies Confederate flags and it's a bunch of fat old white dudes, that's there. But we like Jimmy Dore just fucking laps this up like, oh, yeah, no, we're the libertarian Green Party of militias. No, you're fucking not dipshit. Perfect timing on that one. Thank you very much. I really appreciated that. He kind of formed out of a bunch of libertarians and anti-war activists and everything wanting a place of our own. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the colorful Hawaiian print and, you know, a lot of our members being LGBT and, you know, across the entire. Mo no, no, this is all just bullshit. Boogaloo, Boogaloo boys are not inclined towards LGBTQ membership unless there is a, I don't know, like a, like, like, you know, people who think that there's going to be a fucking race war. So maybe there are queer members of uh, the Boogaloo Boys, but they're queer members who fucking hate anyone who isn't white. All right. God. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to paint this well, man okay, for Collins, being a, uh, for being pro-Nazi. We're putting this together, but uh, as I sit here today, I can't help but think... They're trying to paint a man who's dedicated, like, the last 15 years of his life to fighting for veterans' rights as someone who is pro-Nazi. And not only that, he's a Jewish man. So a Jewish man who's fought his entire life to better the, the civil rights of people in America, to uh, better the treatment of U.S. citizens at the hand of an unjust government, uh, they're trying to paint him as someone who supports neo-Nazis. What an incredible metaphor this room is for the entire process that getting health care and benefits for 9-11 first responders has come to. Behind me, a filled room of 9-11 first responders, and in front of me, a nearly empty Congress. Sick and dying, they brought themselves down here to speak to no one shameful. It's an embarrassment to the country, and it is a stain on this institution. And you should be ashamed of yourselves for those that aren't here, but you won't be 
because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber. We don't want to be here. Lou doesn't want to be here. None of these people want to be here. But they are, and they're not here for themselves. They're here to continue fighting for what's right. Lou's going to go back for his 69th chemo. The great Ray Pfeiffer would come down here, his body riddled with cancer and pain, where he couldn't walk. And the disrespect shown to him and to the other lobbyists on this bill this man has unironically done more for uh, leftism and more for the people of America than any of these gray zone, Brianna Joy Gray, Jimmy Dore chuckle fucks. Utterly unacceptable. You know, I used to get, I, I, would, I would be so angry at the latest injustice that's done to these men and women. And, uh, you know, another business card thrown our way uh, as a way of, of shooing us away. Like children, trick-or-treating, rather than the heroes that they are and will always be. Ray would say, calm down, Johnny, calm down. I got all the cards I need. And he would tap his pocket. Where he kept the prayer cards. 343 firefighters. The official FDNY response time to 9-11 was five seconds. Five seconds. That's how long it took for FDNY, for NYPD, for Port Authority, for EMS, to respond to an urgent need from the public. Five seconds. Hundreds died in an instant. Thousands more poured in to continue to fight for their brothers and sisters. The breathing problem started almost immediately. And they were told they weren't sick, they were crazy. And then, as the illnesses got worse and things became more apparent, well, okay, you're sick, but it's not from the pile. And then, when the science became irrefutable, okay, it's the pile. But this is a New York issue. I don't know if we have the money. And I'm sorry if I sound angry and undiplomatic, but I'm angry, and you should be too, and they're all angry as well, and they have every justification to be that way. There is not a person here, there is not an empty chair on that stage that didn't tweet out, never forget the heroes of 9-11. Never forget their bravery. Never forget what they did, what they gave to this country. Well, here they are. And where are they? And it would be one thing if their callous indifference and rank hypocrisy were benign, but it's not. Your indifference cost these men and women their most valuable commodity. Time. I've never seen this. The one thing they're running out of. This should be flipped. This hearing should be flipped. These men and women should be up on that stage and Congress should be down here answering their questions as to why this is so damn hard and takes so damn long. But John, did you, did you know that maybe a couple of those firefighters 
or police officers were white nationalists? But, but John, why are you supporting white national? Like, guys, this is the equivalent of, like, the Brianna Joy Gray argument, okay? And that's what, it, it makes me mad. Like, it, like it, it viscerally makes me mad. And why, no matter what they get, something's always pulled back, and they gotta come back. Mr. Johnson, you, you, you made a point earlier, and it was one that we have heard over and over again in these halls, and I, 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 I couldn't help but to answer to it, which was, you said, look, you know, you guys are obviously heroes, and 9-11 was a big deal, but, you know, we have a lot of stuff here to do. And, uh, you know, we got to make sure there's money for a variety of uh, uh, disasters, hurricanes, and tornadoes. But this wasn't a hurricane, and this wasn't a tornado. And by the way, that's your job anyway. We can't fund these programs, you can. Setting aside that no American in this country should face financial ruin because of uh, uh, a health issue. Certainly 9-11 first responders shouldn't have to decide whether to live or to have a place to live. And the idea that you can only give them five more years of the VCF because you're not quite sure what's gonna happen five years from now, well, I can tell you, I'm pretty sure what's gonna happen five years from now. More of these men and women are going to get sick and they are going to die. And I am awfully tired of hearing that it's a 9-11 New York issue. Al-Qaeda didn't shout death to Tribeca. They attacked America and these men and women and their response to it is what brought our country back. It's what gave a reeling nation a solid foundation to stand back upon, to remind us of why this country is great, of why this country is worth fighting for, and you are ignoring them. And you can end it tomorrow. Why this bill isn't unanimous consent and a standalone issue is beyond my comprehension. And I have yet to hear a reasonable explanation for why. It'll get stuck in some transportation bill or some appropriations bill and get sent over to the Senate where a certain someone from the Senate will use it as a political football to get themselves maybe another new import tax on petroleum. Because that's what happened to us in 2015. And we won't allow it to happen again. Thank God for people like John Field. Thank God for people like Ray Pfeiffer. Thank God for all of these people who will not let it happen. They responded in five seconds. They did their jobs with courage, grace, tenacity, humility. 18 years later, do yours. Thank you. Dude has been fighting for these these issues for a long ass time. I don't deserve this, yeah, you um, do. but I will treasure it like I treasured Ray and our friendship. I joined the Volunteer Fire Department in May of 1987. The Volunteer Fire Department taught me brotherhood. It gave me a mission in life. And I made the greatest friends that I've ever met in that fire department. In that company that I joined in East Meadow, East Meadow Engine 3, Ray Pfeiffer was an ex-captain. Ray joined the East Meadow Fire Department in 1978. To this day, he is still the youngest captain 
in the East Meadow Fire Department. Ray Fife. Uh, and to people in chat saying, uh, nothing ever came of this, uh, no, actually, uh, something did come of this. They passed the James Zadroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Reauthorization Act, um, in, uh, 2015, and then it was reauthorized with extended benefits in 2016, um, or sorry, they, they passed the, the initial bill in... Let's see, 2008? Yeah, 2008. No, no, 2009, sorry. Uh, and it finally passed in 2010. Uh, and initially it was only covering 9-11 first responders until uh, 2015, so five years. Um, and the city of New York argued that 30% uh, of the first responders who were sick didn't have serious medical issues, so they shouldn't be covered. You know, it, it was a long, arduous legal battle. Um, and then in 2016, uh, it was reauthorized uh, after it, uh, 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 sorry, rather at the end of 2015, in December of 2015, it was reauthorized uh, and passed as part of the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2016. Uh, and extended uh, until uh, extended benefits until 2090. So now John Stewart did did get something done here, along with the help of all of the first responders behind him, and uh, got health care passed for every single 9/11 first responder for the next you know almost century. So. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, no, one, one of the things I always loved about John is that he, he does things with sincerity, which I think is an underrated quality. And, uh, especially in Gen, Gen X, um, is a quality that I think a lot of people 
felt too cool for. Um, so, yeah, he, he's had some yikesy comments in the past, but, like, so is everyone, you know? Well, but also Dr. Robotnik, like, uh, you have to understand that for a lot of people, Caitlyn Jenner was, like, their first introduction to trans people, right? Like, my, my parents only became aware of trans people as a thing because they saw Caitlyn Jenner come out in, in popular media, in mainstream media. You know, so for, like, a lot of people, like, like again, our, my parents' generation grew up seeing, like, Caitlyn Jenner uh, as, as Bruce, like, on Wheaties boxes. It, 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 like, it's a huge deal. A huge, huge deal.